lots of exploiters of them. We know a lot about how to exploit them and how to use them. And we're now starting to look at them in terms of their abilities and capacities. And we're finding things which are astounding us, like uh, proto-morality. You know, there's, there's case after case now where other animals have saved other animals, and not, and not ironically, going back to your first point really, not even of their own species. So you've got a, lo a lot of other animals will rescue, you know, animals of other species. And, and so this discipline is, is teaching us that there's a lot more going on in non-humans yeah. th than we previously thought, or from an exploiter's point of view, if you like, to use that language, uh, more than we want to think. Because obviously the, the first thing that someone does who wants to exploit another is to reduce them in status. Okay? When you start to learn about their capacities, then you get a situation where you might have to reconsider. You touched then, on something in there. Uh, you mentioned awareness and self-awareness and things. Yeah. And just before we move on too far past that, is awareness the key issue for you uh, in, in terms of eating meat? Is it that they are aware on your own? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that, that goes back to something that's been bouncing around Facebook today, which is a Jeremy Bentham quote, which is, it, you know, it doesn't matter if they can't speak or, or they can't reason, it's can they suffer? Okay, and so that that fed into some, somebody mentioned on, on Facebook that probably Peter Singer would be would be mentioned today, and, it, and it's, it's likely. But Peter Singer is not an animal rights advocate; <coughs> he's a utilitarian philosopher, and so, but he picked up on the Benson thing about sentiency, effectively that they can suffer and also they can feel pain, and also the law reflects that. So animal welfare law says that you can't do things to them which, which are very negative, you can't, you can't do things like terrorize them. Yeah. So it recognizes the fact that other animals can be in a state of terror. You know? So animal welfare law is quite interesting in that sense. It's, it's kind of, on that level, it's quite advanced. Yeah. Yeah. Then you've got new or newer ideas from Reagan in the, in the shape of uh, Dene, I mentioned, and Gary Francion and a few other philosophers who have gone back to Singer's idea of sentiency, but have constructed a rights-based argument on that. So yeah, so this awareness thing is, is crucial because if, you, if you're not aware, then you don't have an interest like plants. And so consequently, uh, what, we, what we would argue is that sentiency is the key. And there is another philosopher called Richard Ryder, and he says that we can make sense Everybody in this room should be able to make sense of a moral category called the sentient. In other words, there's something about being sentient that's important. And if you look in terms of human rights, then you would immediately start thinking about the right not to be tortured, a, ne a negative right. Well, that applies to other animals as well. This is why we're trying to get other animals, we're trying to kind of punch holes, if you like, in the species barrier, which you're relying on, in, in a sense, although, I mean, it's interesting, your, your argument is quite interesting, because you're also saying you don't really care about other humans that, that much either, so it's just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I will make the point that um, if it came to a situation where, uh, I, I, you know, in order to survive I would have to eat human meat, I probably would, if it was a plane crash or, or similar. Yeah, well, I doubt I'd kill someone to do it, I think that would be a line too far, but certainly, um, what's the film where it happened? In the yeah, the Argentinian certainly were the apparently alive. Yeah, apparently it tastes like chicken. Um, I w well, we are made of meat. Huh? We, we are made of yeah. meat, exactly, exactly. But everything tastes like chicken. Can they not be more imaginative with that? I would have thought we'd be closer to pork than chicken. Would you? Well, you might. Be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably just like a chicken drumstick or something. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit stringy at this point. Yeah. Actually, there, there, there is there is a film on uh, YouTube uh, which is aliens sat in a cafe, and you know, one, one of them was kind of reporting to them a little bit, like more, more community type situation, and he said, you know, what's the score? And he said, well, they're made out of meat. And he goes, what do you mean, they're made out of meat? You know, these humans, they're made out of meat. You know, that, that's essentially uh, what, what, what we are. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he, he tasted them, you know, you know, in terms of that. But yeah, it's, I mean, it, it is a cliche that we do supposed to um, taste of, of, of uh, chickens. It's everything tastes of chickens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's all the process. Yeah, yeah, so we were discussing about uh, the awareness of yes. the issue for you. Um, so uh, I did a bit of uh, research for this, obviously, but a thing that had come up before, uh, uh, not much, not that much, 
I'm very busy recently. Uh, I saw it a while back, and I found the article again today. It was on the Huff in the Huffington Post, and it was an ar ar architecture student in the UK. I'm sure you came across it. Um, who, for an arts project, essentially in order to challenge assumptions and things like that, he created a design whereby you would sever a chicken's frontal cortex, um, essentially at birth, and then plug it into a matrix-like machine, uh, you know, where it's fed. And there's enough of the brainstem left that it's kept alive. It's able to have its bodily functions, it's able to grow, it's able to do that. But anything that makes it sh a chicken or aware that it was a chicken or anything like that is totally severed. It's, it's literally brain dead. And then, rather than growing battery chickens, where they do indeed software mm -hmm. and things like that, by severing it at birth when they are essentially too young. Yeah. To well, a actually. Can you build more Okay. The, um, the, there have been people working on that kind of yeah, thing, and of, often the tabloid press will call it Frankenstein food. Yeah, stuff, right. right? Uh, but people have been working on that for a long time. I remember from the 80s, they used to be in Cambridge, there was a laboratory called Babraham. And uh, they, they, were, they were doing uh, experiments to kind of create a legless, featherless uh, chicken, which effectively was like almost like a square block of meat, yeah. really. Uh, so there's been, a, there's been a lot of that. And uh, of course now, the, the kind of modern version of that is these moves to bring about um, you, you know, the Petri dish meat. Yeah. Yeah, the laboratory meat. Yeah, and so there, there was a very interesting discussion about that from um, from somebody within the animal movement who was for it, and somebody in the animal movement who was against this idea uh, on a on a blog, and it's called the Vegan Option. It's really well worth uh, listening to because at the moment, because it's an ex ex experimental stage, then they are using things like stem cells. Yeah. There, there is a suggestion that we'll get to a stage where you can create meat yeah. which has got no animal um, component, even kind of historically. Uh, and also, it's interesting, I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I personally would eat laboratory meat if it was from a uh, human dog. I, I wouldn't see a problem with that. Right. You know, I mean, ironically, a religious person might, yeah. but you know, we probably wouldn't. You know, I mean, so it, it, it is the ability to suffer the, the awareness and the fact that for me, other animals are someone else. And just as somebody said recently, when you're dealing with eating meat or using other animals, someone else is involved. And that's what makes it a moral issue for me. Okay. So you'd have, have less issue with the, the chickens with their, their frontal cortex cut off then? Well, obviously, that, that in itself is an experiment, so that is a good section argument. So, yes, I, I would, but in, in terms of the resulting being, yeah. uh, as a non suffering person, you know, it, uh, the, the, you know some, some people have been talk, talking within our movement about whether it would be morally acceptable, for example, to eat roadkill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the grounds that, you know, no, no one deliberately killed this being. You know, I think it's some sects of Buddhism that uh, it's forbidden to slaughter meat, but eating meat itself isn't. Mm -hmm. So they would drive animals off cliffs because then God <laughs> killed them, not them. Oh, I, think, I, think, so, so I, think, yeah. I think you might have to look at intent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the broken argument. Oh, look at cats. <laughs> yeah. Dinner. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not quite sure where I can go with that. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but what, what was the. the Opinion then, what was the sort of um, the stance on that? Well, it, it, it gets around some of the ethical issues, yeah. but it doesn't resolve the social movement issue. Yeah. And so, if you look at the definition of veganism, it's that vegans don't use and consume animal products. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and other definitions are that, that vegans don't want to exploit or be cruel or cause suffering and that kind of yeah. stuff. Now, so it, it deals with that element of it. Yeah. In, in the same way as it would if you were to suddenly go around the corner and you think, ah, dead human body, hamburger, which you yeah. might. Right? And so... Um, it's nice to see you all 